Hey everybody and welcome to the 5 Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors. Liquidware, the platform agnostic workspace solutions provider. And Policy Pack Software, where you use group policy or MDM to remove admin rights, manage and lock down applications, Java, browsers, and mitigate ransomware plus more. And also by Goliath Technologies, who help IT pros be proactive and anticipate, troubleshoot, and prevent end user experience issues regardless of where IT workloads or users are located. Unfortunately, I'm sick again, so I apologize for any audio quality issues. I'm probably not as uh, energetic or projecting of my voice this week. But regardless, if you enjoy the podcast each week, and a major part for me continuing to do it even when I'm sick, you have the sponsors of the show to thank. We just got through Microsoft's Ignite conference last week, and we've now reset the track this week with some fun announcements courtesy of VMware's VMworld conference that was held this week. Some of the announcements include VMware SACE platform, which is on the security side of things, and they say it makes it simple for you to bring essential network and security services near your end users, regardless of where they work. The key components to the SACE platform includes VMware SD-WAN, as the SACE platform takes advantage of SD-WAN's 2,700 cloud service nodes across 130 points of presence. It also features Cloud Access Service Broker, Secure Web Gateway, and Remote Browser Isolation via VMware's new collaboration with Menlo Security. Platform also contains VMware NSX Stateful Layer 7 Firewall Software as a Service, Zero Trust Network Access, which leverages again VMware's SD-WAN plus VMware Workspace ONE in an integrated offering to provide optimal performance and policy-based access centered on the user and device identity for each connection. It features Edge Network Intelligence, which is the integration of the technology VMware acquired from Nyansa. And this solution uses machine learning based predictive analytics to ensure SLAs are met along with providing security and visibility to end user and IoT devices. SACE also includes VMware's Workspace Security VDI, which is VMware Workspace ONE and VMware Carbon Black Cloud integrated into a single unified solution that leverages behavioral detection to protect against ransomware and fileless malware. They clarified that on VMware vSphere, the solution is integrated into VMware tools, removing the need to install and manage additional security agents, which is cool. And because SACE is pretty packed with stuff within the platform, it also contains VMware Workspace Security Remote, which is an integrated solution that provides endpoint management, endpoint security, and remote IT for physical Mac and Windows 10 devices. The solution includes the next generation antivirus, audit and remediation, and detection and response capabilities of Carbon Black Cloud. It also includes the analytics, automation, device health, orchestration, and zero trust access of the VMware Workspace ONE platform. This new SACE platform also contains VMware Carbon Black Cloud workload, which is an agentless security for virtual machines on vSphere. The realization of the vision that VMware say they've articulated at VMworld 2019. This solution makes it much easier for infrastructure operations and security operations to collaborate. So needless to say, VMware's SACE platform is pretty comprehensive. It's very impressive. I feel that zero trust is what everyone's talking about in InfoSec right now. Obviously, edge network intelligence is very important, and you can see some of their competitors are also doing some of that stuff too, so they gotta be competitive in this space. And we're getting to see a lot more of how VMware Carbon Black is really polishing security for VMware Workspace ONE and for VMware workloads. In VMware's announcements, they also state that security risk visibility is now built into VMware vCenter, providing the same visibility as seen in Carbon Black Cloud, thus streamlining collaboration and more proactive threat remediation. 
Security is now dynamically ingrained in the virtual machine lifecycle as a part of VMware tools, making security intrinsic to the infrastructure. And that's also pretty handy too that you know everyone's used to installing VMware tools onto their virtual machines. So adding in those features there makes life a lot easier for us engineers, administrators, and IT folks. VMware are offering a six month unlimited free trial of VMware Carbon Black Workload Essentials to all current customers with vSphere 6.5 and above, as well as VMware Cloud Foundation version four. They also announced that they plan to introduce a Carbon Black Cloud module for hardening and better securing Kubernetes workloads, giving security teams policy governance and control over their Kubernetes environments. So outside of the SACE platform, but also security related and VMware network related. They announced VMware NSX Advanced Threat Pre Prevention, which brings the technology from their recent last line acquisition to the VMware NSX Service Defined Firewall. This solution is the only purpose built distributed scale out firewall designed to protect east west traffic across multi cloud environments. The service-defined firewall uses unsupervised and supervised machine learning to identify threats and minimize false positives with the ability to apply virtual patches at every workload and not just at the perimeter, which they claim is an industry first. They also now have a commercial offering consisting of signed images and binaries and full support for open source project Antrea, which is related to VMware container networking. This is to be included in VMware NSXT and vSphere 7 with Tanzu. They say that while Entrea can get you started, when you look to scale container networking across clusters, that's where NSXT shines. And related to NSXT, version 3.1 contains new API-driven advanced routing and multicast capabilities, along with automated deployment of workflows through Terraform Provider. And for those using VMware vRealize, VMware vRealize Network Insight version 6 Network Assurance and Verification now leverages formal verification to gather network state to build and model how the network functions. The model is then used to provide continuous verification of business policies across virtual, physical, and multi-cloud networks. Unsurprisingly, something they championed during the conference is the fact that with the recently announced Azure VMware solution, which I talked about in the podcast, I think only a few weeks ago. Um, but with that announcement, VMware now supports AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, IBM Cloud, and Oracle Cloud. So they've got most of the big bases covered. And I guess pretty intelligently during the conference, they announced some, I guess, new shine on VMware Cloud on AWS specifically, since that's their key cloud-related offering. And that includes the VMware Cloud Disaster Recovery, which I believe is tying in with their Daytrium acquisition for the Disaster Recovery as a Service. It's really impressive stuff. I've talked about it in multiple episodes of the podcast, so I won't get into it anymore right now, but check it out for sure. They also announced VMware Tanzu support. They announced something called VMware Transit Connect, which provides any-to-any -any connectivity between on-premises, VMC on AWS SDDCs, and AWS VPCs using AWS Transit Gateway and AWS Direct Connect Gateway. I don't understand any of that, to be honest with you. <laughs> they now also meet some new regional compliance listings. So if you're in a industry that has a lot of sensitive data, and VMware Cloud on AWS was not an option before due to compliance issues. Maybe revisit that again. They specifically mentioned HIPAA, BAA, EBA, and G Cloud. It also comes with enhanced automation and operations, as well as enhanced HCX capabilities, plus more. So I feel like this is already going to be a lengthy episode and I've covered a lot of the announcements already. I don't want to cover absolutely everything that was announced or get into the nitty gritty, so I'm not going to focus too much more time on VMworld. And while there are some really, really great announcements, like the ones that I've already discussed, some of what was announced or discussed more so during VMworld is stuff that was 
already announced over the last few months and we're just kind of seeing where it is on the VMware roadmap and where it aligns and integrates with their offerings. But something that's definitely worth talking about quickly is the fact that they announced something called VMware Project Monterey, which is in preview. So VMware has been pursuing smart NIC virtualization, so for your network, and integration opportunities over the past couple of years, which led to this announcement of Project Monterey. They say Project Monterey takes advantage of emergent hardware innovations to offer new approaches to hybrid cloud architecture and operations with a focus on performance for applications, data, infrastructure, and security services. They state Project Monterey will also provide further capabilities to scale storage capacity on demand to meet performance or capacity requirements. They also shared some information around bare metal loads and composing of machines with Project Monterey and talked about running the ESXi control plane on a smart NIC, freeing all of the x86 host cores to run other workloads inclusive of bare metal. That allows you to run workloads on bare metal while still being able to integrate them with the core SDDC services such as VMware vSAN and NSX. From a flexibility perspective, these options take VMware Cloud Foundation to a new level in terms of the ability to dynamically support a variety of hardware interfaces composing infrastructure on demand. So that seems like a pretty significant announcement from VMworld. It may have the potential to help reimagine and re-architect VMware vSphere, VMware vSphere in the future. It could be a lot lighter than it is today and more flexible for this great new cloud world of ours, even though the cloud's not new anymore. <laughs> and I thought that was the last thing I wanted to talk about from VMworld announcements, but I just remembered, I saw that Patrick Koble shared a link for VMware Carbon Black for Horizon, which got some new features, including Horizon Full Clones being supported, Horizon Instant Clones version 7.12 and 20.06 with 3.5 and later sensor, are supported at preview capacity apparently. Horizon Instant Clones version 7.13 with 3.6 sensor or later are supported at GA capacity. But the support around clones is pretty important for VMware Carbon Black for Horizon, so that's pretty cool. And probably a story that we're all already aware of, but earlier this week there was an outage for Office 365 customers that, caused, that was caused by a problem with the Azure Active Directory service. Starting at approximately 925 UTC on September 28th, customers may have encountered, Azure customers may have encountered errors when attempting to authenticate to Microsoft services, including Microsoft 365, Azure, Dynamics 365, or custom applications that rely on Azure Active Directory for authentication, which nowadays it can be a lot. They state that users who were not already authenticated to cloud services using Azure AD would have seen multiple authentication request failures. Impact was primarily in the Americas based on the issue being exasperated by load, but users in other regions also experienced some impact. Users that had previously authenticated prior to the issue may not have experienced any noticeable effect. Microsoft stated they discovered the preliminary root cause and the extended impact as a combination of three separate and unrelated issues. One, a code defect in a service update. Two, a tooling error in the Azure AD safe deployment system that impacted regional scoping. And three, a code defect in Azure AD's rollback mechanism resulting in a delay in reverting the service update. Sounds like a perfect storm. Something breaks and then your mechanism for rolling back the change also broke. They claim that their monitoring automatically detected the issue within a minute of initial impact and that their engineers engaged immediately to initiate troubleshooting. They also state that once they did get a successful rollback, full recovery for most customers was confirmed by 1223 UTC, that's 1223 AM on September 29th. And unfortunately, at the time of this recording on October 1st, there was further disruptions for their Outlook service. And at the time of this recording, there was no root cause or even a fix. The issue was ongoing. And although they say that it's just Outlook, I've noticed some access denied errors and some other authentication errors within 
the Microsoft MFA. It shows that the status is up for that service, but I'm having problems and I've seen some other people on Twitter suggesting they have too. So maybe I'll have an update on that one on next week's episode. This week, Avanti announced acquisitions of Mobile Iron and Pulse Secure VPN. Avanti will acquire all outstanding shares of Mobile Iron common stock for a total value of approximately $872 million. Mobile Iron stockholders are said to receive $7.05 in cash per share, which represents a 27% premium to the unaffected closing stock price as of September 24th. In their statement, they say that the terms of the Pulse Secure acquisition are not disclosed. Mobile Iron have been a pretty big player in the mobile management space for some time. I think their market share has been getting chewed away over the last few years, particularly with Intune becoming more widely used by enterprise customers. Pulse Secure VPN has popped up in different episodes of this podcast over the last few years for security bugs. And that's pretty unfortunate, but in fairness, I've been doing the podcast now for a while. It seems like that's the case for all VPNs. VPNs are just a nightmare. I will say that I've used Pulse VPN before, and it's all right. I still think VPN has its use cases in some areas, limited. Uh, But it shouldn't be the only remote access solution, that's for sure. It's worth noting that Avanti have put together a very impressive portfolio of products over the years with previous acquisitions like Landesk, Lumension, AppSense, Res, and others. So if you're not familiar with Avanti, maybe you're a complete Microsoft shop, you should check them out and look at the different products they have on offer and the different companies that they've acquired over the last few years. It's pretty impressive. In an interesting story this week, the source code for Windows XP, Windows Server 2003, and some other Microsoft operating systems was published online this week. The payload included source code for Windows 2000 as well and embedded versions CE 3, 4, 5, and 7, plus Windows NT version 3.5 and 4, and even the first Xbox operating system plus MS-DOS version 3.30 and 6. It said that there are also source code for some various Windows 10 components too, but doesn't sound like the full operating system. The OS sources that were leaked online was via a torrent file that was about 42.9 gigs in size on 4chan, which is a dark, dark place to go on the internet. Microsoft hasn't confirmed the leak yet as of this recording, but ZDNet reports that some Windows experts have suggested these are legit, and in fact, someone out there was able to cobble together the code for XP and get the operating system to work from what was in the torrent file. It's believed the files leaked via academia. It'll be interesting to see if Microsoft confirms this and they share what was at the root of this getting leaked. This week, ZDNet covered a really interesting story about a unique phishing campaign and subsequent attack that cybersecurity architect and bug bounty hunter Craig Hayes called, quote, the greatest password theft he'd ever seen, end quote. The article describes how one day they got an alert of a compromised account. They locked the account and then received alerts about some other compromised accounts too, which was in itself not all that unusual. It could have been a phishing campaign that caught a few people that morning. Just a case of contain and deal with it, but the alerts kept coming in, suggesting it may have been a highly effective phishing campaign. They remediated the compromised accounts and unlocked them for use again, but then discovered a group of accounts were being accessed from suspicious locations. Upon reviewing, Hayes and his team found the attack vector. They found that once one email account was compromised, the credentials for the account was sent to a remote bot. The bot would then sign into the account and analyze emails sent within the past several days. For each unique email chain it found, it replied to the most recent email with a link to a phishing page to capture credentials. The wording was generic enough to fit almost any scenario and the link to a document didn't feel out of place in the email. 
It said that trying to distinguish the bot from the genuine account owner was difficult. The technique resulting in a worm-like mass takeover left Hayes in awe of the phenomenal number of accounts that were compromised within a few hours. The phishing emails were also sent to other people outside of the organization and via reply alls. The phishing attack was out of control by this point and the only way the team was able to clamp down on it was by finding a pattern in the URL of the phishing pages that could be used to add to a quarantine rule. ZDNet states that multi-factor authentication was quickly implemented for email accounts that it had not been enabled for to add some additional security measures. It stated the likely intention was to harvest credentials and sell them on the dark web. It's also stated that while this was the likely intention, the quick spread and the disturbance that was made caught attention and the compromised accounts were fixed so the credentials re retrieved may be useless to them. That's what the article says, but hey, a lot of people use the same passwords for their personal emails and email their personal email accounts from their work emails, so they may have that too. So I bet when there's a will, there's a way. This one may not be over yet for the hackers. They may have got enough information to do some other nasty things. Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktops version 2009 has been released. And because this feels like a really long episode already, I'll just fly through some of the highlights that I saw, at least in the what's new. And that includes support for VMware vSphere version 7, which includes ESXi version 7 and VMware vCenter Server 7 as well. Also support for Microsoft System Center Virtual Machine Manager 2019, which I haven't tried 2019. I wonder if it's, if it's gotten any better. From an authentication perspective, there's support for FIDO2. And starting with this release, you can use a security key to allow only approved storefront and Citrix gateway machines to communicate with the delivery controller. It does say after you enable this feature, any requests that do not contain the key are blocked. So you can use this feature to add an extra layer of security to protect against attacks originating from the internal network, which is pretty interesting. They're also adding AppV single admin HTTP or HTTPS streaming. So you don't have to do streaming from a file share. You can use the HTTP or HTTPS protocols for streaming now. Interestingly, there's now a VDA-based wake on LAN for remote PC. That's one of the challenges with remote PC. It's great that they're able to get their own persistent, powerful desktop back in the office, but what happens when like the cleaner accidentally turns the machine off or something like that? They're not able to get in the next day. So the ability to use wake on LAN to wake up the machine is very beneficial. Also starting with this release, multiple concurrent sessions can access a profile container and you can put an entire user profile in its profile container. In addition, profile management now accesses the VHDX files in a user context and does not grant domain computers full control of the folder where the VHDX files are stored. So that's pretty interesting. You can put an entire user profile in the profile container. Be interesting to see how that one works. There was more in the announcement, but I just suggest that you check that out for yourself. And I'll share a link to the announcements with this episode, which is episode 144, and you'll find that on 5bytespodcast.com under reference links. Before I get away from Citrix, though, after upgrading Citrix Workspace app for Windows to version 2009.5, if you receive cannot connect to server errors when connecting to Citrix Workspace, it's recommended that you have to reset your Citrix Workspace. And that's covered in article CTX 282687. The great Jim Moyle released a new version of his FSLogix shrink script with improvements to cope with the underlying disk subsystem. There's now checking remediation for prerequisite services. He's introduced throttling of threads, better error messages, and better parameter validation. So there were a couple of pretty aggravating and worrying stories this week related to businesses with messed up work from home strategies. ZDNet reported on one organization that has been insisting on all employees joining on an ongoing Zoom call. So one long Zoom call throughout the day that everyone stays on. Crazy. 
The employee of the organization states that their employer suggests this is for the benefit of the staff to give them the feeling of working together in close quarters like in an office. But to me, it sounds like a hellscape. There was also a story in the BBC about a small London-based firm who uses something called Hubstaff software to track their workers' hours, keystrokes, mouse movements, and websites visited. In this case, the founder states it's good for them because it gives some level of accountability for their overseas operations and it allows them to ensure they're following procedures and getting work done in time expected, as well as let them detect if some in the organization are completing the work quicker than expected so they can ask them how they're doing it so they can learn if there's a quicker way and a more efficient way to do things. So wrapping something pretty terrible in most likely false messaging, pretty terrible. And the article also mentioned another company called Sneak who offers technology that takes photos of workers through their laptop and uploads them for colleagues to see. Photos can be taken as often as every minute, although the firm describes itself as a communication platform and says everyone on the app has the same experience whether they are an employer or an employee. So I worked some places before where they used something called Observe It, which I thought was pretty awful and I wouldn't want it used on me. But there are many different products like this and they all play into poor management, no trust and low morale. So not good. On Tuesday, Cloudflare announced its Cloudflare Web Analytics, a free-to-use toolkit that largely replicates what Google Analytics offers, minus what they call invasive tracking, and thus the ability to assess the performance of targeted ads carried on websites. Cloudflare's Web Analytics is immediately available to the company's paid customers, but any website owner will be able to use it from some point in the coming months. Fortune.com have said that the move could prove particularly attractive for organizations running online services in Europe, where privacy laws say people should be tracked online only after they have given their act of consent. And a quick note from my buddy Joe Schonk, for those upgrading Citrix ADC Gateway version 13 to 6435, to fix the latest CVEs found in CTX 28.14.74 that disabled a few default authentication settings and re-enabled CXUIP, the new authentication defaults may break your storefront configuration with Gateway. So heads up if you're doing that. Nutanix CCA version 3 has been announced, which brings several new capabilities and improvements over its predecessor. The improvements include high availability, so frame administrators can now set up more than one CCA for a single cloud account and thereby prevent any downtime in cases where a single CCA may not be available. There's also NVIDIA Grid vGPU backed instances, and you can have use of proxy server which, which allows secure outbound and inbound traffic from the CCA to the frame service. All welcome enhancements for those using WeFrame and Nutanix AHV. And for those interested in the enterprise application side of things, heads up, Andreas Nick is doing some training on the 30th of November 2020 through December 3rd. And there's an option to do it in person, but also to do it remotely. And he's going to cover AppV, AppV with FS Logics too plus MSIX and MSIX app attach. I've covered a lot of tips from Andres on the podcast. He's a really sharp guy, so it would be excellent training. And on the topic of excellent AppV trainers, I saw that godfather of AppV himself, Tim Mangan, tweeted that with the TechNet AppV forms closing, customers have been asking him where to post their questions. He's pointing everyone to AppVert Guru and to the fact that he just added a new app v form for modern times for anyone who wants to put new content there and anyone interested in attending the e2evc hybrid event set for athens greece on november 20th and 21st registration is now open so get yourself registered 
It has been announced that Nerdio's Community Edition will launch on October 21st. So if you're interested in WVD and Nerdio and automating it and making it as easy as possible, there's going to be a Community Edition for you to use pretty soon. And if you want more information on that, like how and where to get it and get it activated, what it is meant for and what is not meant for, what features are going to be supported in the Community Edition, how many users are allowed to use it, and so forth, there's going to be an event that you can attend virtually. And I'll share a link with this episode to the event, which again will be on 5bytespodcast.com under reference links. And actually last week, I saw that Telephone, which is T-W-E-L-E-P-H-O-N-E, has been launched by Chris Matthews, who I had the pleasure of interviewing on the Frontline Chatter podcast with Jerry and Gibson, and who actually previously founded a company called Computes, which got acquired by Magic Leap. But when Computes was originally launched, I covered the launching of that on, I think, the very first or the second episode of this podcast. So I was like, oh, it's kind of like full circle. He's launched a new business, a new product. I should talk about it. So Telephone is an instant peer-to-peer video chat and conferencing platform that uses your social media context as your phone book to communicate with family, friends, colleagues, and customers. It provides untraceable in and outbound video calls and meetings with no downloads required. It is simple and secure with, with end-to-end encrypted ephemeral calls. So pretty interesting idea to kind of combine your contacts throughout all your social media for video calling kind of like aggregating all the services together and i could see why he's launching this now given the increased reliance on such technology with covid so best of luck with that chris this week forbes reported on an interesting story about a sample ransomware attack on a coffee machine in a september 25th blog post by martin ron a senior researcher with security vendor avast He described how he set about discovering if he could hack a smart coffee machine without first compromising either the network it was connected to or the router itself. Martin discovered the coffee machine was essentially acting as an unencrypted access point. He was able to reverse engineer the device and hack it, thinking that he would try to set it up as a cryptocurrency miner. But due to its lack of a solid CPU, he decided to instead launch a ransomware attack making the coffee maker malfunction loudly, forcing the owner to either pay a ransom to get the thing to stop malfunctioning loudly or unplug the coffee maker forever. While this is a pretty low impact ransomware attack, it has been speculated that the coffee maker itself could be used as a gateway to get to the router and other devices on the network as it's an unencrypted, unsecure device. And now this episode's scripts, tricks, and tips. This week I saw a pretty interesting tool on systanddeploy.com, which is a really great website. And the tool will help you build a PowerShell system tray with menus, submenus, and pictures. So it's not just like a little icon or a little shortcut in your system tray. You're able to have like a miniature type start menu within your system tray, which is pretty cool. This week I also saw that Samir Busadan had tweeted that One way to check Windows machines with UAC turned off is that you can notify on explorer.exe with high integrity level. He said also related but not valid for all situations, explorer.exe with the command line no UAC check can also be a way to tell if UAC is turned off. So interesting for admins to be able to do that to ensure security but also potentially interesting for hackers who want to check if UAC is disabled or not. I saw that Thomas Maurer shared a link and a reminder to check out all of the various different free services offered through Azure. So not everything with Azure is paid to play. There are some free services. So some of these could be pretty interesting to you. Also, if you've never checked it out before, there's some 12 month free trials in there too for stuff that usually does cost money. So if you want to dip your toes into Azure and you never have before, you definitely want to check out this link and I'll share it with this episode as I will with everything that I talk about on the, on the podcast. 
And I think it's been a few episodes since I've had one from Guy Leach, but he shared that if you need to install just the Citrix virtual apps and desktops PowerShell commandlets to interact with like catalogs, delivery groups, or what have you, maybe you have a scripting server and you're installing the full studio, you don't really need to do that. He gives you uh, install commands to just install those PowerShell commandlets to keep things as light as possible. Christy Lemaire also shared a PowerShell module cache utility that she created, and this action makes caching PowerShell modules from the PowerShell gallery easy for both Linux and Windows runners. If you're using GitHub Actions to test projects that rely on PowerShell modules like PS Framework or DBA Tools, this caches those modules so they aren't downloaded from the PowerShell gallery over and over again. Efficiency. Nasruddin Benchakali shared a really interesting blog post that's very handy in virtual environments or even just physical desktops too. And it's on how to figure out which services are hosted in svchost.exe instances. So that's a lot of applications. I know for example, I think Citrix Receiver and probably Citrix Workspace is in there. I think WriteFax is in there too. And a bunch of different applications that I have to deal with on an ongoing basis. So if you're curious, check that blog post out. And my buddy David O'Brien shared a pretty interesting blog post where he goes through cloud security and why we are still getting the cloud security basics wrong. It's a quick two minute read, but it's pretty insightful. And you should definitely check it out. And finally, Ray Davis shared a blog post on upgrading sites from version 715 of Citrix virtual apps and desktops all the way to version 1912. And that's going to be a pretty common upgrade scenario as people are going from one LTSR version to the most recent LTSR version. If that includes you and you're planning on doing an upgrade, you should check out the steps that are very detailed by Ray and I'll share a link with this episode. Well, that's it for another episode. I'm sorry this one ran so long. I think, like I said last week, when there's a conference and there's a lot of announcements the episodes tend to be a little bit longer than usual so if there's no conferences next week expect a shorter episode thank you all so much for listening